Hi, good afternoon. Um, welcome to my presentation, first of all. Um, it's going to be a little more high-level presentation than the one you have seen before. You have been in this room. Uh, in my presentation, I will share with you uh, the experience I have uh, collected together with my team uh, in uh, building and implementing uh, the applications which were deployed across multiple uh, either public clouds or in a hybrid cloud model, so where we had some uh, private cloud and uh, public cloud connectivity. Um, my name is Yaroslav. Uh, however, you can call me Yarek as well. Um, I'm with Red Hat for almost seven years now. However, I must admit with shame that this is my first time on DevConf. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and before we get started, I would like just to ask you who of you is from Red Hat in the room? Okay, so we have like half, half, good. Um, so, um, so this journey uh, with uh, uh, this kind of architectures has started for me around five years ago. Uh, and if you can recall, this was the time uh, when Red Hat has released OpenShift 3. Um, Actually, uh, some customers uh, were invo involved earlier in, uh, in, in OpenShift, so they, they, they started together with us some um, uh, implementations of this kind of architecture uh, just shortly before uh, OpenShift were re was released. And in this presentation, I will try to, to uh, share with you some uh, findings or some interesting aspects of uh, building this kind of architectures. So when we started five, five years ago, it was like kind of uh, totally new space uh, for, for everyone. Uh, however, now if you uh, look on, for example, this, this kind of research, uh, you can see that actually nowadays uh, most of the customers who are uh, willing to deploy some applications in, in the public cloud, uh, they will use some sort of either multi or, or hybrid cloud uh, strategies. So it, now it's more like uh, the mainstream and also the, uh, the tooling, the software I will talk about has matured over these five years to, uh, to, to make this kind of projects much easier than, than it was in the past. Uh, so there are, there are quite a lot of good reasons why, why customers are using this kind of architectures. Um, there are three major groups, I would say. The first one is related to the uh, cost management. So um, public cloud is not, is not for free. Uh, in fact, it's, it could be quite expensive in some scenarios. So, uh, so this, this kind of architectures might be a good way to, to contain that kind of cost. Uh, there are some, you know, some, some technical reasons like um, uh, increasing availability, reduced latency, and so on. And also there might be some uh, um, compliance or, or regulatory um, requirements, especially related to data management and data transfer ac across uh, different, uh, different geos. Um, so these are the uh, most typical topologies that uh, I was working uh, with uh, within this uh, five years journey. Um, so the most projects, they, they, they started in a way that people who were uh, experimenting with public cloud, they typically uh, started to put some uh, non-production workloads into, uh, into public cloud. And, and later on, they, they moved uh, um, uh, also with production. Uh, but typical, the, the starting point for many customers was to run some non-production systems in uh, uh, systems on environments in, in public cloud and, and running production uh, in-house. Uh, uh, the, uh, the second use case was uh, where uh, um, we, we wanted to build a solution or system that was distributed across uh, multiple geos. So if you, if, you were, if you are working for some global companies or you are involved in some global projects, um, sometimes uh, you know, they have some applications that uh, they want to be available across the globe. So they want to serve customers from Europe, Asia, US, and, and typically this means that 
uh, they might want to deploy the instances of the applications across the geos in, in different clouds. Uh, the other use case is about uh, scaling. So uh, there are some types of applications uh, which typically uh, require some limited resources, but there are some uh, points of time, some peaks or uh, some um, other events where they need uh, dramatically to scale up. Uh, and this is also a, a kind of good case for uh, for leveraging a public cloud where we have this uh, additional resources available uh, on demand. And the other, uh, the other scenario is when we are layering our application. So uh, this is typically uh, done in the way that we have some data layer that sits in our private cloud, but then we have some, um, some APIs or some frontends that could be deployed in uh, uh, public clouds and they, they communicate with, with the backend that, that, that are running in, in, a, in the private cloud. So this is more or less the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, setup for, uh, for my presentation. And this is what I will be talking about uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, um, in, in my presentation. So there are essentially two parts. Uh, one is more for developers, so how to, how to uh, architect the application, how to manage uh, CICD uh, and application deployments across multiple um, or, or hybrid clouds. And the other one is uh, more about the operations of how to manage things like networking, data replication, um, management, monitoring, and security. Uh, one more question for you. Who of you is more like developers? And who is the operations? Okay, so we have like 50-50, so good mix. Uh, I guess there are also some DevOps who, who do both. Um, all right, so let's get started with the application. So as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this journey started at the time when, when uh, uh, Red Hat was releasing OpenShift uh, version three based on, uh, based on Docker at the time. So. Uh, the containers are really the, the key component of uh, those application architectures. Um, and uh, in this kind of projects, uh, uh, there was always uh, uh, a requirement uh, to containerize the, the application uh, in order to achieve maximum portability, um, which, which is needed for uh, this kind of multi or hybrid cloud deployments. And of course, we had like two, two, two types of uh, situations. So either we wanted to migrate existing application or we wanted to develop a uh, completely uh, new one. Um, so in regard to, to existing applications, there are basically three strategies that, uh, that works uh, well in a, in a real life. So, so the first one, the strat first strategy is called uh, rehosting, and this is where we simply try to lift and shift our application. So, uh, in essence, what that means, we take our application as is, and we containerize uh, the layers or the application itself, depending on what is the architecture, whether it is monolith or it has some more layers. Uh, and this this work well, this works well for uh, for some uh, some types of the application. So. Um, especially for technologies that, that are kind of modern and, and not really legacy stuff. Um, for, for other applications, uh, other possible uh, strategy to, to migrate was uh, the uh, strategy called Replatform, and this is where uh, we uh, basically uh, keep existing uh, application as is, uh, but we try to uh, build uh, with the containers uh, any new uh, capabilities that are uh, introduced to the application over the time. And those new capabilities are built using the, the containers and, and they are um, designed to run in, uh, in, in containerized environments. And then of course we need to build some kind of integration layer as you can see on the slide between uh, our existing system and the uh, and the new uh, new layers, new components that we uh, introduce. Uh, this is of course more complex approach than 
uh, than uh, the previous one, but still uh, um, works uh, well in, in many scenarios. And then we have the third approach, which is uh, refactoring. And these are typically the most complex uh, projects where we, where we are really uh, taking the effort to rewrite our application into, uh, into uh, the new containerized uh, architecture. So this might also mean that we migrate from monolith architecture to microservices, or we do any other needed uh, architecture changes. So these are typically uh, big and complex projects that, uh, that uh, take um, a lot of time and, and are costly, uh, especially compared to the previous two uh, approaches. Uh, when we talk about uh, developing new applications, uh, uh, we, uh, we standardize on uh, cloud-native uh, approach. So what it really means that uh, we, of course, uh, standardize on the containers as a runtime, uh, microservices as the architecture, uh, the API as a standard of communication between uh, microservices and DevOps uh, as a processes to, uh, to manage the uh, um, CI/CD for for applications, uh, and when we had a uh, when we had a containerized uh, application, uh, we need a platform to to manage and and, and deploy uh, the application uh, in our uh, multi or hybrid cloud environments, and of course the um, the, the platform uh, is is OpenShift, so. Um, uh, in OpenShift, uh, by the way, who of you is familiar with OpenShift? Okay, so most of you, so <laughs> no surprise. Um, so uh, what OpenShift give, gives us, uh, it gives us uh, uh, flexibility uh, of uh, uh, the platforms, uh, and it gives us uh, basically the consistent uh, user experience across different uh, different um, uh, clouds. So if we combine uh, OpenShift with, with portability of containers, we have pretty good foundation to, to be successful in, in deploying our applications into, uh, into multiple, uh, in, in multi or hybrid cloud uh, environments. Uh, uh, but uh, containerization, uh, however it works in many scenarios, it uh, doesn't work in, in, in all scenarios. Uh, there are still and there will be still some workloads that are running in virtual machines and we find it really uh, complex or uh, too expensive to, uh, to take the effort to, to migrate those workloads to, um, uh, to containers. Uh, however, uh, on, the other, uh, on the other hand, we want to uh, we want to leverage the benefits of having OpenShift as a consistent platform uh, for, for running applications. And uh, there is an effort uh, in the community to, to build a platform uh, that, will, uh, that will let you uh, run uh, virtual machines natively in, in OpenShift. Uh, at the moment, it is still uh, a community effort, uh, but uh, if you are interested in this kind of uh, use cases, uh, I encourage you especially to have a look on QVIRT projects, also on uh, MetalCube, which are the, the main uh, projects uh, which will uh, provide us, uh, the which will provide the capabilities for uh, Kubernetes and for OpenShift to uh, run natively um, uh, KVM-based uh, virtual machines. Uh, so there is a hope and uh, that also container, uh, natively container, uh, sorry, uh, natively virtual machine based workloads uh, uh, will be able to, to, uh, to, to leverage the, the, the value, the benefits of uh, OpenShift. Okay, so, so we, have, uh, we have the uh, containers, we have the, uh, the, the platform, uh, to run our application. Now, the first thing we need to, to uh, implement is, is CI-CD. So, uh, our first attempt to, to CI-CD for uh, in multi or hybrid cloud environment was really to leverage existing 
tools and knowledge. So in our case, this was uh, a Jenkins. Uh, and the only, only change we made initially in our uh, uh, pipelines was to, to introduce uh, the uh, multi-cluster uh, deployment of uh, images that were, uh, that were tested, uh, created and tested during, uh, during our pipeline, pipeline execution. Um, this, this worked uh, for us pretty well, but uh, at some point uh, we had a number of uh, situations where um, the deployments to, to some of uh, clusters that, uh, that, we, that were uh, part of, of the platform um, has failed. Um, and because this step was part of our pipeline, this, 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 meant, this, this means really that, that, that our pipeline um, uh, has failed. Um, and we started building some, you know, some, uh, some uh, solutions uh, in Jenkins to, uh, to handle this kind of situation, but, but really at some point we realized that this is pretty much uh, the road to nowhere because uh, there will be always some new issues with the networking that uh, we, we, we didn't cover and, and you know, Jenkins is not the, uh, the platform to, to replicate uh, container images across uh, different, um, different uh, mm, clouds or uh, environments. So uh, this is where we uh, uh, actually, maybe a bit of coincidentally, uh, at the, uh, the, the same time, uh, pretty much the same time, Red Hat made the acquisition of CoreOS. And with CoreOS, we acquired also a container registry called Quay. Um, and Quay uh, provided for us um, one functionality which was really uh, the one we needed, which is uh, the uh, geo-replication. Um, so with Quay geo-replication, as you can see here on the, on the picture, you can uh, basically deploy uh, image to one instance uh, in your um, uh, distributed uh, Quay environment. Uh, and then uh, Quay will uh, distribute the images across all registered um, or connected uh, instances. So this was the way uh, how we moved forward. Um, uh, so um, we started to, to leverage Quay, uh, which was deployed uh, across uh, multiple uh, clouds uh, in different geos. And uh, Quay was, uh, we um, give a Quay responsibility to, uh, to replicate uh, the images across, uh, across the, um, across data centers. Um, another challenge here was to, uh, um, um, uh, was the management of the application configurations uh, across uh, different uh, data center. So, uh, so uh, we had OpenShift cluster in each data center deployed, and we uh, and we needed to to replicate application configurations across those clusters in a consistent manner. Um, and now it's probably pretty obvious that that for this kind of challenge uh, you you will leverage GitOps, but uh, when we when we when we uh, when we have been facing that problem three four years ago, it was not not that obvious. Um, so probably now you know what what uh, what the, was the idea behind GitOps. So uh, we keep our application configurations, um, which are YAM based in the JIT repo, and then we have an engine that uh, can uh, replicate those configuration. Uh, across uh, multiple uh, registered uh, Kubernetes or uh, OpenShift clusters. Uh, and uh, at the time we made a decision that we will leverage, uh, we will leverage Argo as the engine. Uh, and Argo actually gave us uh, a very, a very nice uh, functionalities. Uh, so f first of all, it, um, uh, with, you can register multiple uh, clusters that can be deployed 
um, anywhere across different um, data centers, clouds, uh, geos. Um, it, of course, synchronized the application configuration with the G repo. Uh, what was also very important, it give a, as, gives us possibility to uh, make some overlay configurations which could be specific only to some data center. So if you think about um, um, Kubernetes or OpenShift application, um, there are a number of uh, configurations that are specific for your, uh, for your data center. So things like some credentials, so typically config maps, secrets, uh, ingress configurations, they are, uh, they are specific to, uh, to, to every, uh, to every um, uh, cluster or application instance. So we, uh, we needed, and, and we got it with Argo, uh, we needed the, uh, the, the ability to, to make some overlay configuration specific for, for the clusters. Um, then of course, uh, Argo can uh, synchronize for us uh, the, the configuration uh, to, to each of the cluster. And what is also very, very important and very useful about Argo is that this last thing. Um, so, uh, Argo will also uh, monitor the configuration of your application on each of the clusters and will detect if someone locally makes some changes to the configuration uh, and will revert that change to, uh, to the configuration that is defined in GTrepo. So this, will, this also makes, uh, uh, you know, it reverses a little bit uh, the way how we manage the configuration uh, because we don't manage the configuration via um, command line or, or web console of, uh, of uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes, but uh, we, we leverage uh, as a single source of true uh, the uh, JIT repo. Um, over the time, um, um, so GitOps, uh, um, might become even uh, even easier because uh, we have uh, our community have introduced op concept of operators. So with operators, you can basically uh, package uh, together the application configuration, uh, and uh, this uh, makes uh, nowadays uh, some application configuration easier. So there is. You can uh, you can um, transfer some um, or you can package some application configurations into operators so uh, so that uh, your uh, your app configuration becomes uh, becomes uh, easier. Um, and there is a uh, there is a community effort to to build kind of a standardized solution for. Uh, for um, uh, for this use case, so uh, for uh, federation for, for federated deployments and, and of applications, but this is still kind of uh, work in progress. Um, so uh, early days, uh, and um, I, I don't see like this is moving uh, forward uh, fast. Uh, so I think still the, the approach with the GitOps is the, the best way how we can manage application configuration in uh, multi, uh, multi uh, or hybrid cloud uh, environments. Uh, okay, so now uh, the, um, the second part, uh, maybe a bit more related to operation, uh, operations and infrastructure. So the networking. So, um, so, so from, from the networking point of view, uh, hybrid and multi-cloud uh, introduces number of challenges. Uh, the first challenge is how you manage the traffic ingress. Uh, so you have, uh, instead of one cluster with some ingress load balancer in front, you, you will have like multiple uh, clusters. Uh, each of them will have their uh, own local load balancer. Uh, and what, what you will need here, you will need some uh, global traffic manager, uh, which will be able to distribute the, uh, the traffic uh, between, uh, between these uh, multiple um, uh, clusters. 
So GTM typically is a DNS server, so it doesn't really, uh, uh, so the traffic don't, do not really go via, uh, via GTM. Uh, it is a DNS uh, also some, with some advanced capabilities related to geolocalization, for example. So uh, it might, uh, as a DNS, it might give you different IP address, uh, IP address of one of these load balancers, depending on from where you are um, sending your request. And this is quite, uh, quite important in some scenarios, especially if you want to uh, distribute the, the traffic um, uh, according to a geo from uh, of, of, the, of the of the requester. Um, the other the other challenge uh, is uh, 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 the service mesh uh, in uh, uh, multi and hybrid cloud. So, who of you is familiar with service mesh? Okay, some of you are. So service mesh is very useful in, in a situation when you have, uh, when you have uh, the microservices architecture. Uh, with uh, service mesh, you can manage all the aspect of the uh, network communication between, uh, between the, the microservices. So um, think of security, think of some uh, uh, policy-based routing. Uh, also, it gives you some very, ni very nice uh, uh, observer uh, monitoring or op observability. Um, but on the other hand, it's, it is quite uh, heavy and, and complex component of, uh, of the um, um, Kubernetes or OpenShift architecture. Uh, and um, Service mesh has, uh, gives you at least three options how you can, how you can uh, um, deploy it and manage it in a multi-cluster environment. Uh, so the first two options uh, you can use if you have uh, completely separate networks uh, between your data centers. So for example, if you, if you have uh, um, if you deploy your application in, in different clouds, in multiple clouds, uh, this, this might be a case. Um, and uh, um, the, the, third option of the third approach requires that you, uh, the third option requires that you have, uh, that you have um, a single network between, the, uh, between, between your um, uh, clusters. Uh, so, so there are some, some um, tweaks uh, uh, in, each, in each of the approach, so, so it's, um, it's, it's not easy really to, to, to analyze and decide which, which option to use. Uh, in my experience, we typically use the, uh, the, 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 second, uh, the second option where uh, we uh, wanted to avoid to have uh, multiple control planes in, in the mesh, so we wanted to keep service mesh configuration in single uh, location, and we wanted to, um, um, to, to, be, to have the service mesh managed in the central way, uh, and this is how it looks like in a, um, um, and the, the, this, uh, the, this image shows you this, this scenario. Um, so in regards to networking, there, there is some, uh, also some, some community effort to, to make it easier to uh, connect uh, multiple, uh, multiple clusters. Uh, so the one project uh, where we also, uh, as a Red Hat, uh, uh, contribute is Submariner. Um, uh, with these projects, uh, they try to build kind of uh, VPN uh, that runs on, on top of open uh, sorry on top of Kubernetes, so that you can easily uh, connect uh, different networks, uh, and you don't need to go deeply into the uh, infrastructure layer to to open some tunnels and so on. Um, there are other projects, uh, Lighthouse and Coast Guard, uh, which are also aiming at uh, uh, building the uh, networking. Uh, for uh, multi-cluster uh, scenarios um, uh, easier. But this is still uh, still a community effort, so um, it's not yet available. 
Um, next thing, data, data replication. So um, data replication uh, basically um, uh, has two complexities. So the first one is the technical one, so how you can, uh, how you can um, send the data in an efficient way between, uh, you know, between different continents uh, even or uh, be between different networks. The other one is about the cost. So um, the cost of, uh, of, of data replication uh, between uh, public clouds can be very, very substantial. So uh, you cannot underestimate that factor and you should always uh, think uh, and analyze uh, whether this won't uh, make your uh, architecture or your use case um, un unacceptable. Um, so, uh, in regards to data replication, there are basically three um, three possible scenarios. Of course, uh, if if you don't have to, the best way is to do not uh, to do not replicate the data. But if you have to, you can theoretically consider three options. So, either you will use some infrastructure layer, so st storage layer replication solutions, um, or uh, you have two options on the applications layer, so either you replicate the data uh, using some uh, application level technology, or you leverage the uh, data partitioning and, and you don't really replicate, but you just partition your data across different uh, clouds. Um, uh, the, the infrastructure-based uh, synchronization, uh, of course, especially in uh, public cloud scenarios, uh, might be uh, impossible, especially if you are thinking about some hardware-level uh, replications. Uh, however, there is a, uh, there is a um, development and progress in, in building uh, software-defined uh, solutions to replicate the data. Uh, the one which, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, now a part of uh, Red Hat offering is, is, is Nuba uh, Cloud Object Gateway. So these solutions uh, let you uh, replicate the, the object storage uh, between different, uh, different uh, cloud or uh, private and, and public cloud. Um, the kind of downside of the solution is that it, uh, it uh, exposes the uh, data using the S3 API, so this is not feasible for any kind of applications. Uh, you need your application to be, to be able to leverage S3 API. Uh, but once you, you have this, this uh, uh, you meet this requirement, uh, Nuba can replicate for you um, uh, the, the object storage across different, uh, different clouds uh, in a transparent way from the application point of view. Um, um, so, but this is, this is quite new, so uh, even, even in Red Hat, we just uh, introduced this as part of, of uh, our new container storage uh, version 4, which was released, I know, a week or two weeks ago. Uh, so w what we typically used to do uh, in, uh, uh, in the past in our project, we used to leverage some application-based replication uh, solutions. Um, so this is an example of uh, uh, the multi-cloud uh, architecture of uh, Red Hat single sign-on uh, platform, uh, which is based on the Keycloak uh, project. Uh, so this uh, platform, uh, as you can see, uh, is using two uh, persistent layers. So uh, one is a relational database, which in this example is a, um, is a MySQL database with, uh, with uh, uh, Galera for uh, uh, multi-master replication. And the other one is uh, data grid. So this is in-memory cache to, to offload some, some data from, from the grid. And as you can see here, um, uh, both uh, Galera and, and, and JDG, they, 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 they have built in um, cross data center replication functionality, 
which is built using some um, um, custom protocols uh, running um, on, on layer layer four, so TCP or uh, UDP, and this is uh, this is typically the most uh, feasible scenario to, to implement that data replication uh, in uh, in um, whenever one of your data center is in a in a public cloud because um, as I said before uh, you won't be able to replicate data using some some infrastructure solutions uh, similar approach uh, is uh, uh, to use. Uh, the messaging platform, so uh, AMQ um, offers uh, the interconnect functionality which uh, lets you uh, exchange the, the messages uh, between uh, the uh, distributed uh, data center so that, so that users can uh, send a message into one data center and, and some uh, consumers may, may consume the same messages in uh, in, in different uh, data center, and this is again based on some layer four uh, replication solution, which is built in into uh, AMQ uh, interconnect. Uh, so the next thing is management. So uh, nowadays, multi cluster, multi cloud management is very hot topic. So many vendors. Uh, started uh, to build or to offer uh, some solutions in that area. Um, so, uh, in case of in case of Red Hat, so what what we what we did and, and what we are doing. Um, uh, so, first of all, uh, we have uh, significantly uh, improved uh, uh, the process of installing and upgrading OpenShift. So I'm referring here to, to OpenShift 4, which nowadays you can uh, install using the full stack automation strategy, where basically uh, uh, you need to, um, to provide like five up to 10 parameters, and uh, you will have a cluster deployed automatically uh, in, um, let's say, half hour. Uh, there are also two uh, hosted, hosted offerings, so one uh, uh, dedicated, which is, uh, which is hosted on AWS, the other one is uh, hosted uh, offering on Azure. Um, so from the um, installation and upgrades point of view, um, there is not much more effort to, uh, to manage uh, the uh, multi-cluster OpenShift environment versus uh, some, some single uh, or, or private cloud uh, environment. Uh, we are also uh, offering uh, in a, a software as a service model uh, the OpenShift Cluster Manager console. Um, uh, but this console is not really for the, uh, to manage the, the platform. It's more for us to uh, offer you and provide you some services like subscription management or um, or updates uh, some proactive support uh, services and I think this platform is built uh, to, to meet this 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 kind of uh, use cases uh, however um, because we we joined the the, the IBM family uh, there is also uh, there is one more uh, product which uh, looks like will be uh, our um, um, go-to platform for uh, the, the multi-cloud management uh, or multi-cluster management. Uh, it is IBM Cloud um, multi-cloud manager. Um, um, the significant part of its functionality is the management of Kubernetes clusters, uh, and it already offers quite advanced cap capabilities in regards to the uh, visibility of your cluster, so you can register uh, multiple clusters to the console and and, um, and and monitor them from from the metrics from single instance. Uh, it also uh, has some uh, uh, some uh, nice functionalities related to the uh, uh, workload deployments. So this might at some point um, complement what uh, we are doing cu currently with uh, GTOPS. Uh, it offers you some, also some uh, functionalities for the two operations, so updates, patching, and so on. 
uh, and I think that over the time this will be uh, integrated with uh, OpenShift 4 capabilities. Uh, this platform itself can be deployed on top of OpenShift, so, um, and I'm uh, expecting that uh, soon you will hear more about that, uh, that product as our solution for multi-cloud uh, or multi-cluster management, um, both in on-premise and in, uh, in, in SaaS um, um, offering, offerings. Um, next thing is monitoring. So um, OpenShift uh, comes with uh, building monitoring stack, so based on the, uh, based on the uh, Prometheus and, and Grafana. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are basically two scenarios how we can leverage that uh, monitoring stack in, in the multi-cloud um, or, or multi-cluster uh, environment. So the first approach uh, uh, which I um, I have experience with was to uh, deploy a, a separate Grafana instance uh, which um, uh, which uh, um, wh where we define some dashboard that uh, connects with uh, Prometheus instances running on, on, on separate uh, on separate uh, on different uh, in, in different um, clusters or, or clouds uh, the other approach, which is uh, um, pretty new, uh, is to leverage the Prometheus Federation capabilities. So uh, you can have a, um, a Prometheus instance that will uh, that will replicate um, uh, the metrics from the, will pull the metrics from uh, Prometheus instances running uh, running uh, on your uh, on your clusters, and then uh, use Grafana to to to, to to create some, some dashboards. Um, however, um, um, in these two scenarios, uh, the, the, the big concern was really uh, a cost of uh, getting the data from, uh, especially uh, in, in public cloud scenarios, getting the data from uh, the, the public clouds to uh, to, to, to Grafana or here from uh, one Prometheus to other. Uh, I was involved in one project where we did some tests to compare uh, the, the volumes of data uh, for some dashboards that were built uh, in Grafana. Uh, at this time in this project, I, I cannot say this is a general rule, but we find out that uh, using Grafana to uh, to, to collect metrics from Prometheus uh, was cheaper than, um, um, than, than letting Prometheus to, uh, to, 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 co to, uh, to federate with, with other Prometheus uh, instances. Uh, but I, I cannot say, if this is a general rule, maybe if you somehow optimize, uh, uh, reconfigure Prometheus, you will uh, be more efficient. Uh, with the uh, second scenario. Uh, and the last topic uh, is uh, security. Uh, so very important thing. Um, so OpenShift is uh, uh, by design uh, very, um, or very secure platform. So on every layer, starting from the operating system, you heard today maybe the presentations uh, uh, which cover this, uh, th this operating system uh, level security. Throughout all the, all the layers of OpenShift, you have uh, built-in security controls that let you run it uh, in a very secure uh, manner. Um, also, uh, from the uh, container images point of view, uh, there is very nice uh, uh, container scanning functionality, which is part of Quay um, uh, container uh, registry. But what was really a missing part in OpenShift was to the ability to uh, to define some uh, and, and enforce uh, define and enforce some uh, multi-cluster security uh, policies um, that would be uh, enforced and. Uh, deployed and enforced across multiple clusters at once. 
So uh, we have been uh, uh, playing with Open Policy Agent, which is pretty cool solution to define some security policies. Uh, it runs as an admission controller, so if you know admission controllers, uh, they are uh, kind of low-level interceptors of requests to Kubernetes API. So um, they have access to all the data that is sent to the uh, ETCD database. So uh, with those uh, admission controllers, you can easily um, analyze uh, anything, any data, any YAML uh, content that is sent to, to the API. Uh, but uh, Open Policy Agent has no multi-cluster support, so uh, if you will use that uh, solution in multi-cluster environment, most probably you will need to leverage uh, GitOps tool or uh, any other um, uh, replication tool to, uh, to, to manage uh, in a centralized way uh, the, uh, the security policies. Uh, the IBM uh, multi-cloud manager, the tool I mentioned uh, in regards to management, has uh, also quite nice compliance module where you can define uh, compliance policies. And with that, uh, uh, it has also built-in capability to replicate the data across, uh, across uh, uh, multiple clusters. So this is also, um, if we look on the products available on the market, I think this is the, uh, the best solution uh, for, uh, for this uh, challenge. Um, so I, I leave, uh, I, I put a couple of links for you. So if you want to go deeper um, with uh, some of the uh, topics I, I briefly discuss, uh, here are the links. Uh, I, I, uh, I leave the presentation uh, um, here for, for you to download. So uh, feel free to, to, to learn more about the, uh, the stuff. And I think that's, uh, pretty all from my side. Uh, yeah, I'm almost uh, taking my time, but if you have any question, I think I can have now one or two. Anybody? Say again? Can you repeat? Sorry, I, I don't hear you. Download page. Uh, well, uh, I uploaded this presentation to um, um, to, this, to the conference schedule page. So I think if you go to, to 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 my presentation in the schedule, you should have some link, hopefully. Okay. Any more questions? Please. Yeah, for data transfer. Yeah, can you quantify the request, like how to try it? Um, it, you know, it's, it's also a matter of optimizing. Um, but uh, at the time when we did some tests, it was probably two times more expensive uh, to, to let Prometheus um, get the data from the other Prometheus instances versus letting Grafana to execute the PromQL queries to, to Prometheus. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Okay, so thank you very much for your time.